And I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 98. All right, I thought it was just me that January seems to be going by so freaking slow. But I saw like two memes today. One was like, we're six months into 2020 and it's still January. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Yes. Another one was like, it's January 37th already or something like that. And I'm like, oh my gosh. It really is. Like, we're still in January. <laughs> I feel like. It's so true, but also like, really, what does it matter? Well, I'm ready for warmth. Oh, no, not me. I love winter. No. But you know what I mean, though? Like, really, like, what does it matter? Like, as far as, like, it's not like we're still in college or something. We're like, oh, my God, I can't wait for this semester to get over or whatever. You know what I mean? Well, I get no days off in January, so I'm ready for Memorial Day. That's true, though, because you come off. Of, well, you do get days off in January because you were off January 1st. Oh, Lord. <laughs> That's still considered 2019. <laughs> But really, though, I think that's probably what makes January so hard, though, because you have two holiday weeks back to back. You get so used to these short weeks, and then you're like, God, three fucking long weeks in a row? And because it's taking so long to get through January, I still feel like I'm in that weird, weird mood. What do you mean? Just kind of blah. I don't know. I think, too, because it's been rainy and cold. It has been raining non-fucking-stop this month. And you know I wear flip-flops. Come on now. Did it stop you? No, I just complained the whole time. (laughs) Almost did fall in a Japanese restaurant. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god, it was so funny. Like, if y'all could have seen her face. I thought I was going down. (laughs) She thought she was a goner for sure. But I had quick reflexes. You did. I've never seen you move that fast. I don't either. I'm sure my leg was sore for a week after that. (laughs) What the quad's going on here? (laughs) Well, either way, those aren't sore on me, but my feet are. Because I went to a Mardi Gras ball this weekend. It was so much fun. Got to get dressed up, do my nails, do my hair, do my makeup. I mean. Who are you, Lizzo? All of which I did myself. Well, Casey did my nails. No, she did not. Casey did my hair. But, like, I didn't, like, go get my nails done, you know. But I got to do the whole thing and drink and party and dance and all the things. Did you almost fall on the dance floor? Mm Mm-mm. Okay. Well, that's why your quad isn't sore. True. But you know people be spilling drinks and shit on the dance floor. Oh, yeah. I would have fallen. Yuck. You know who else is getting the whole shebang? Patreoners. So thank you so freaking much, Taylor J. from Nebraska. Amber D. from California. Julie O. from Louisiana. And Olivia C. from New Jersey. Thank you all for joining Patreon, the Creepinati, being Patreoners, all the words that mean the same thing. We hope you all love the bonus content. And if we've never said your name and you want us to, head over patreon.com slash the APC podcast. Okay, so you know how we have been talking about synchronicity from that show Hellier? Hell yeah! Well, it happened again. I've been planning on doing this story that I'm doing this week for like a week. Mm-hmm. Well, Sunday night's watch party, the subject of one of our videos was this, this subject. Yeah. Yes. And Kelly M. from our Facebook group, she does not like Hellier because they say synchronicity a lot. And I was like, Kelly, I know you hate this word, but this is what's happening. Like, I'm yeah. doing this this time. She's like, holy shit. And I don't hate the word. I just hate that they say it 30 times. <laughs> <laughs> they do say it a lot. But also, I was attending this live tarot card reading today, and the guy who was doing it, He said something, he was like, it's the synchronicity of blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that damn word. It's the $5 word right now. It is. And I'm just like, okay, so now that I know that word, I'm hearing it a Mm -hmm. lot. However, I'm like, or is it the synchronicity of that? Yeah. And so then I go down a rabbit hole of my thoughts. And are we all in a simulation? All of the things. It's very butterfly effect. Yeah. 
All right, so picture it. 1950s, Xochimilco, Mexico City. Sorry, names. Don Julian Santana Barrera, a man of many names, apparently. He was a man who lived in Mexico City and sold vegetables. Well, after he went to market, he would go to the local bar and drink. And so a lot of people said he was a drunk. However, due to superstitions or some unexplainable events, he stopped drinking and would preach the Bible at the market instead. Okay. Well, people did not want to listen to him, so he was supposedly exiled. However, another thing said that he had, quote unquote, found religion and wanted to live a secluded life after that. The thing is, he had a wife and children. Oh, so he just like up and left them because the Bible told him so? Yeah, he up and left them. So he sailed down the canal to a Chinapas, which is a man-made island or a floating garden that was created by the Aztecs. Okay. He was just going to grow some vegetables and live his life as a hermit, basically. Well, one day, not long after he moved to the island, he found a body of a young girl who had drowned in the water. <gasps> He tried to save her, but he couldn't, and he felt like a failure and also just really bad that this child was dead. Yeah. Well, shortly afterward, there was a doll that was floating in the water exactly where that girl was found. So Don Julian believed that this doll probably belonged to that little girl that he couldn't save, and so he took the doll and he hung it from a tree, kind of like an offering out of respect. There's other theories as to why he did it. They said to honor the girl's spirit or to appease the spirit of the dead girl and keep him and his island safe or to keep the spirit of the dead girl safe from demons that were lurking around in the afterlife. Shit. So it was just him on the, on the island? Mm-hmm. Okay. No man is an island? Uh, No, you haven't met Don Julian yet. Okay. Well, I was like, I mean, you report that to the authorities? Like, how's that work? Right. Well, he began to hear footsteps at night. He also heard, like, cries that sounded female. And so he's like, okay, I need more dolls. I know where you're going with this. (laughs) Well, then he started thinking that these new dolls he would get were also possessed by spirits of other dead children. Oh, God. And so he continued just to collect all of these dolls, hang them up over the entire island. And according to people who were close to him at one point, he like was a man obsessed. And it was almost like he was compelled to do this by an unseen force. Yeah. For the next 50 years, he would collect dolls. And he would get them from the canals around him, from the trash. The trash from whom? The market and stuff. Oh, so he was still going to market. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, okay. I just pictured this man alone on a fucking island with nobody to talk to. And I'm like, how's he getting these dolls? Yeah, I mean, like, he his island is a ways away from people. Mm -hmm. But it's all connected through canals and stuff. And so... Like, he still, you know, would get around. Okay, 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 gotcha. So, yeah, he would hang them from the trees. The parts were hung on branches with, like, wire and string. He would take dolls, even Barbie dolls, in any condition. He just needed them and needed a lot of them. Some were in good condition. Others were not. (laughs) Like, some would be headless. Some would be, you know, missing limbs, missing eyes. Basically, Sid's wet dream. Yeah, yeah, Sid from Toy Story is all I can think of. (laughs) Yes. And the dolls were not always hung from trees because obviously he would run out of trees. So some were nailed onto the fence. Others were on spikes. Uh, Hello, Ed Kemper. That's very creepy. Mm Mm-hmm. So there was this cabin. It was a small little shack that he lived in. Well, he also filled that with dolls. And some of these, he would dress them up, accessorize them, if you will. Like some had sunglasses, others had headdresses, that kind of stuff. 
Like, and it was his most beloved dolls in there. I wonder how many of them he'd named. Oh, I don't know. Overall, the island had somewhere around 1,500 or more dolls on display. Mm -mm. And it's known as the Island of the Dolls or Isla de los Muñecas. Sorry for my Spanish. (laughs) So a lot of people thought that the island looked really creepy. Uh, Because it does. (laughs) Well, and if you think about it, especially over the 50 years, even the dolls that he had that were in mint condition when he got them. Oh, yeah. Were wrecked because of just nature. I was going to say, just the fucking rain. Yeah. Sun exposure, you know, all of that. So, I mean, they none looked like, oh, a Cabbage Patch farm. No. Yeah. (laughs) It was like the Garbage Pail Kids. Damn. Damn. So a lot of the locals and stuff, they were creeped out by this. But Don Julian, he was proud of it. And he saw the dolls as protectors. And, you know, like if someone was going by, probably rubbernecking, taking it back to the last episode, Mm -hmm. you know, he would be like, come on, like, come in, you can look around. And if you want to take photos, like, small fee. Damn. I mean, he's a hustler, baby. I was about to say, get it, old Donnie. <laughs> well, I mean, and everyone has morbid curiosity. So, of course, some are going to be like, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's what I would do. I'll pay my $5. Mm-hmm. All right. So, skip to 2001. Don Julian passed away. Oh. Yeah. And his body was discovered in the canal... The exact place that he said that he had seen the girl. What? Yeah. Do we know what he died from? Some reports said a heart attack, and then other ones said drowning. Maybe he had a heart attack and drowned? Yeah, like heart attack fell over. Yeah. I don't know. But the heart attack didn't kill him, but he was like incapacitated, and so he drowned. Yep. I mean, probably. Oh. I know. A lot of people, and this includes his own family, did not believe that he ever found a girl. Why, I wonder? They believe that he made it up or he imagined the whole experience. Oh, my God. Did he have, I wonder, well, I don't know if you know this, but did he have a history of mental illness? Some things I found said he had mental illness, and it's like, who else would go and live on an island? And I'm like... Um, lots of people. Yeah, I'm like, well... There's like a whole fucking show on HGTV about people buying islands. (laughs) True. But, you know, like, I don't know. I was just like, I don't know. Maybe, but I, I don't know. And I'm not talking like anxiety, depression. I'm talking about the kind of mental illness that makes you have a delusional experience where you think that something happened that actually didn't. Right. And it becomes this whole alternate universe for you. Yeah. One of the family members was quoted in an article I read, and this line just struck me and just was like, damn. And so they said, quote, the whole time he had been haunted only by his own mind. Oh, my God. And it's like, whoa. That's so powerful. Yeah. So now that he has passed, a lot of the locals believe that his spirit is on the island too. And some of them say it's a charmed island. Not creepy or like super scary. But other people are like, nah, bitch, it's scary as fuck. I don't go by it. Oh, shit. Yeah. I'm going with scary as fuck when you have all these fucking doll eyes on you. Right. Well, word got out, and so tourists began flocking to this island, and most of them wanted to pay tribute to the girl spirit and to Don Julian. They would bring dolls of their own, leave coins, you know, all of the things there as tribute. His nephew now lives on the island and keeps it open for people. Hmm. So, of course, there have been some experiences There's local lore, all of the things. Word on the street is that you can hear the dolls whispering to each other. Mm Mm-mm. 
And then some of the people who were on boats that would be near the island said that they just felt compelled to go to the island. Like the dolls were luring them to go down to the island. There is one incident where a photographer, his name's Sebastian Perez Lira, he lives in Mexico City, but he wanted to go and explore this like spooky place, Mm -hmm. you know, and he's a photographer. So he's like, this is going to be amazing. He was quoted as saying that the atmosphere is super calm and peaceful and quiet. But then when you're on the island for a little bit, your nerves just start getting the better of you because there's so many dolls around that you feel like someone's watching you. Mm. And it could be, and you never fucking know. True. He said, you cannot accurately describe the feelings when you are standing in the middle of all of these dolls. Nerves invade you as you approach one. So another instance was this guy named Tino. He is like a tour guide. He said he took three girls to the island. They wanted, you know, to see what was going on. Two of them really wanted to go, but one did not. And she said that she was a psychic, and so she could feel all of the stuff. So she was like, I don't really want to go. That's a lot of energy coming out of all those dolls. Yeah. But she gave in, and they headed to the island. They get there, and they go to the dock, go up. And about five minutes later, he said that they all came running back. And the girl who was a psychic, who did not want to go, she was crying. And when he's like, what, what, what? Like, what happened? Like, between her sobs, she said that a doll was laughing. Oh, fuck no. Mm Mm-mm. Yeah. So he was like, okay, I'm going to go up there. I'm going to check it out, see if it was someone up there, you know, playing. No! Playing tricks on you, whatever. Yeah, sorry. But he said when he got up there, he could hear the laughter, too. Mm Mm-mm. And he said that there was this doll, and it was dressed as a rabbit, and it was just laughing. And he could not believe what he was seeing. Did they check it for batteries? Even if it had batteries. Well, if people are bringing dolls and stuff as tribute, you don't know how long that one's been there. True. I mean, it could have gotten there the day before. Very true. Logical thinking there. Someone who is not logical all the time is old Dibbic Douche. So, of course, him and his crew went. As soon as they arrive to dock, they hear some noises that's coming from where a fire pit's located. Well, a little bit later, a fire is sparked in that same area and no other people were on the island. What? Yeah. They felt cold energy throughout, you know, even at their base camp. They're over by the shack and one of their detectors goes off saying that there's energy around. Well, Aaron sees a black figure walking outside of the bridge and then he continued to see that figure on the bridge billy he saw lights in the shack same time that the apparition was captured and they actually did capture this like rectangular black mass in the shack wow they did a spirit box section and they got a man's voice and stuff like that Of course, Zach felt icy hands moving up and down his back. And because they were going to Island of the Dolls, Zach had just got Harold the doll, who's like really haunted and all of the things. So he was like, "Mm, let me bring him and see if he feeds off of their energy or whatever, you know? Well, he's about to get him out of the bag that they brought him in. And like... They're all, like, trying to get the perfect shot, all of the things. Well, then you hear a doll laugh. No. Yeah. And when they go to check out who's laughing, one of the dolls that's by who, like, the laughter, it's a lot of doll heads and shit on the wall, and you can't tell. But there's one that has, like, a pink bunny suit on. Shut the fuck up. No. So it's like... Uh, what? A doll that was dressed like a rabbit was laughing. Like the rabbit from the other story? Mm Mm-hmm. Holy shit. So I don't think the batteries can last that long. Damn. 
So if you want to go to the island, it's available. But the only access is by a Trejanera, again, question mark, question mark, which is like a water taxi, very big canoe that's decorated with flowers, like a gondola. Yeah. A lot of the people who, like the rowers, that they're like, okay, yeah, we'll transport you to the island, you know, whatevs. But there's some that will not go near it because of superstitions or, yeah. you know, things like their families had, you know what I mean? Like everybody has, a, has an experience kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. But also be sure that you're not going to the fake doll island. What? Mm-hmm. Because, well, people suck and this is why we can't have nice things. Yes. And so people will take you to that one and be like, yeah, 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 sure. And they don't have to be worried about anything, you know, because it's not the real one. That's some fucking bad juju for those people that have taken people to the wrong fucking one. Mm-hmm. But Damn. Crazy. And, you know, again, with these stories I do, it really is, It like, they come from sad stories. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's just like, he lived alone, and if he did have a mental illness, like, it almost wasn't by choice to yeah. live alone. But, like, even if, even if it wasn't because of that, he spent half a century, like, trying to save this one soul. Yeah. That may or may not have existed. And if she didn't exist, you know, put it on my psychology, only took one class, y'all. Um... <laughs> My hat, was he just really trying to save himself? Because, like, she was kind of a manifestation of something inside of him. Mm -hmm. Maybe, and he just didn't know how to identify it in himself. And I wonder, since he was found in the same position, like, if he did save himself. Mm. It came full circle. Yeah. That's fucking poetic, Donna. Shit. (laughs) Thank you. Would you go? Yes. Me too. Yeah. I mean, it's creepy as fuck just looking at it and stuff, but I wouldn't want to go there. I think that, like, once we got there, we would see and feel all the things like you just talked about. Yeah. Like, for him and his, like, essentially soul searching. Mm Mm-hmm. My biggest fear would be going through the canals. Because, like, green water... Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I've seen this on a couple of things and, like, of course, like, all the pictures and stuff, but I had no idea why it was a thing. Yeah. And, like, one man. I wonder how he, I know you said he still went to the market and all of that, so it sounds like he sold his vegetables and all still, but it's, Mm -hmm. like, that made enough for him to sustain himself on this island for 50 years. Yeah, because, I mean, he grew his own vegetables and stuff. So, I mean, he only really needed something to eat. True. So, this guy has a big enough, amazing enough garden to sell and eat off of for 50 fucking years. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, I can kill an aloe vera plant. Right. Well, I have a whole new damn perspective on this story. I know. It's It's not as scary anymore. Yeah, it's not scary. It, like, it totally took the creepiness out of it. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you showed me some of those photographs that people have taken that are, like, look very scary. Yeah. But, I don't know. Something about, maybe it's the way you told it. I don't know. It just took the creepy factor out for me. No, I wouldn't want to be there after dark. Oh, fuck no. Let's just be honest. Mosquitoes. Well, and there's, like, tons of insects and spiders nope. and oh, no. all of that that do, like, they Crawling are, in and out of the eyes of the yeah. bugs and yeah. the things mm-hmm. and the dolls. No, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. No. Mm-mm. No, thank you. Mm-mm. I'll look at it from afar. All right. This is a story that has been on a bunch of different stuff. So you may have heard it, or maybe not. It was on Forensic Files. It was on the show called Murder Calls on... Um, ID? Yeah. So, lots of things. All the things. Very popular. Couple of books about it. All the things. All right. So, we are traveling back to May 31st, 1985. And we're going to Lexington, South Carolina. I didn't know there was one in South Carolina. So, picture it. It's the end of the school year. Kids are getting out, getting ready for their senior trips, starting to get ready for the summer. Graduation is just around the corner. 
And 17-year-old Sherry Faye Smith is one of them. Did they play Alice Cooper's Schools Out for her Summer? Probably. Is this dazed and confused? No. Okay. Sherry was this young, beautiful girl who was full of life, had tons of friends. She was very close to her family. And she had been out all day with her boyfriend and some of her friends from school. They had been having a blast down at the lake, swimming, sunbathing, everything. Well, that afternoon, she comes back home. And her dad was at home because he was a minister. And so he was in his home office working. And he looked up and he saw Sherry pull into the driveway and stop at the mailbox. The driveway went super far from the house. So he could see her and he goes about his work and he's, you know, like, dang, Sherry had not come inside because she was one that every time she got home, if her dad was there, she went into whatever room he was and hugged him. Hey, love you, blah, blah, blah. Like they had a very close relationship. So it wasn't like her to come inside the house and not at least stop by and say hello. Okay. So he's like, okay, that's weird. Let me go check on her. He goes down the driveway, and it's like this beautiful tree-lined driveway. It's about 750 feet. He goes down there to check on her. And when he gets there, he doesn't see her, but her car door is open. The engine's running. Her personnel's in her car, and he's like, where the fuck is Sherry? So he's looking around, and there's nothing. It's like she fucking up and vanished. Like a fart in the wind. Exactly. Well, here's the other thing. Sherry had diabetes, but apparently it was like this more like extreme rare version where she had medicine that she had to keep with her all the time, which I'm assuming is insulin. But apparently with her type of diabetes, she had to like constantly be drinking water and if she didn't, she would dehydrate very quickly or something. Just that's kind of what I've gathered from the few things I've listened to and read. I don't really know exactly what type, but I don't know. Anyway, she had some form of diabetes and her medicine was crucial. Well, her medicine was in her purse in the car. Oh, fuck. So her dad knows at this point something's very wrong because she would not have gone far without her medicine. The further she would have gone is... Maybe right to the woods, right next to the mailbox to use the bathroom because she has to drink all that water. And when she got to go, she got to go. But she wasn't there. So he wasted no time calling police. In fact, it was only 42 minutes from the time that she got to the mailbox. And he was like, hey, she's not here until the time that police were in the living room being like, what happened? Damn. Which I feel like is very good for... 1985? Yeah. The police were like, at first, though, are you sure she didn't just run away? Of course. But her parents were like, absolutely not. Her mom was like, I know my child. And she's like, with her medical condition, there's no fucking way that she would have just run away without her medicine. Right. It, I mean, because literally it's a death sentence, you know? I will say, too, though, of course, these people are at the very least middle class. She's white, blonde, all the things, so... I mean, just to throw that out there, I feel like, of course, in 1985, hell, even today, but for sure back then, there was going to be way more publicity and all the things. It didn't take long for people to come out in droves to help them search. Hundreds of volunteers helped search land, air, everything. And her parents kept waiting, thinking, okay, maybe we're going to get a ransom call, something. Finally, they get a call asking for money, and it turns out to be a prank. Not her no. kidnapping, the ransom call. Yeah, no. What an asshole. Who, I, like, fuck you, whoever did that. Yes. Ugh. Well, there were many law enforcement agencies involved. FBI, they had brought in profilers. Like, it was kind of... a. I know I've said this like four times already, and it's been 10 minutes of the story, but especially for 1985, it really was all hands on deck. Let's find this girl. Like, let's put all of our resources in and find her. So volunteers search tirelessly for three days and find nothing. Holy shit. There was one set of bare footprints, like, from her car, but that was it. There was nothing. 
until the third day at about two o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. And this time it's a man and he tells her parents, I'm sorry that I took your daughter. He gave very specific details about what Sherry was wearing, like what her bathing, because she had a bathing suit on, her clothes, you know, her towel that she had used that day was still in her seat. You know, oh my, she was, oh my gosh, I know. And so he described everything she was wearing, gave them a little bit of detail even, and then was like, in a couple of days between, let's say, I think it was like 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., you'll get a letter from Sherry. And so they were like, well, he clearly knows the area then because he knows what time the mail is usually delivered to their house. Fuck. So they were like, okay, well, so he's got to be some sort of a local. You know, they're just trying to put these pieces together. And so the police were like, fuck that. We're not waiting. So they like wake up the whole post office and is like, give us this letter. So the police get the letter, analyze everything, make a copy to give it to the parents because they knew he was going to call again and ask, did you get the letter? And so they had to show it to the parents because they needed their reactions to be genuine and true because the guy would be able to see through it. Yeah. He even told them the letter was going to be dated June 1st, 1985, and that it was going to be time stamped 3.10 a.m. And he was like, well, really, she wrote it at 3.12 a.m., but I just had a round. So it's, that's why it says 3.10. So it's like this like minutia that didn't matter that he knew. You know, so it was like, okay, well, this guy's clearly not the fake guy that called before because, again, yeah. he's got all this detail. And that's not detail that someone would make up, you know? Right. So the letter was titled, Last Will and Testament. <gasps> no. And this was proven to be her handwriting. And it said, I love you, mommy, daddy. She names a couple of people. And she says, you know, everyone and all other friends and relatives, I'll be with my father now. So please, please don't worry. She says, please don't even let this ruin your lives. Just keep living one day at a time. She tells them, please do not become hard or upset. Everything works out for the good for those who love the Lord. Because they were very religious. Like I said, her dad was a minister. In the letter, she tells her family that she wants a closed casket. The fuck? Yeah. Well, I mean, she knew she was going to die. Like, yeah. he made her write out her last will and testament. And so she's saying everything that she can. You know, I love you. Please don't. But why? Because she thinks she's going to be. I guess she thinks she's going to be beaten. Gosh. Or maybe she had already been beaten. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so because her family was about to leave for a trip to the Bahamas, like a cruise or something. She even wrote in the letter, I'm sorry about the money wasted on the Bahamas trip. Please go without me kind of thing. So, of course, forensics are working now like around the fucking clock on this letter. Her parents have a copy of it. And it's the it's the kidnapper again. And he's like, did you get my letter? And he tells... Sherry's mom, Sherry is now part of me, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, our souls are now one. So in my head right there, though, I'm thinking at the very least, he's raped her. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And it breaks my heart because she was very religious. She was only 17. I bet she had never had sex before. Yeah. I mean, like, that just breaks my heart. Yeah. Well, this time, police were able to trace the call. It came from a payphone like 20 miles away from their house. And so the police obviously rush there. And when they get there, it's like a fucking movie moment. The phone is like dangling from the hook. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Wish they had CCTV. Right. Okay. So. Also, put the fucking phone on the hook. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, because they checked it for prints and stuff, and there was nothing there. So you clearly did that. Just fucking hang it up. Right? Ugh. You want to piss Donna off? <laughs> don't do some shit like that. Like, get up from your table at a restaurant and don't push your chair in. Oh, my God. I told you. Yes. Well, and we, me and Carrie do not see eye to eye on this, but... I do it now. No. <laughs> <laughs> She's yelling at me enough. I do it now. <laughs> but, no, but about... Guys putting the toilet seat down. Oh, I don't when give a shit finished. about that. That's what I'm saying. 
I do. But see, you grew up in a house where your dad put the toilet seat mm-hmm. down, and I grew up in a house where my dad didn't, so it doesn't fucking bother me. It's just like a respect thing for me. I don't understand why. I don't know, because it's just clean, too, more so. Like, I don't want to see the underbelly of the toilet seat. So they have to touch it, but not you. Mm-hmm. And they have to lift it up, but heaven forbid you have to put it down. Yes. That's dumb. Well, have better aim and just don't have to put it up. Why do they have to put it up? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Like, why is that a thing? I don't know. (laughs) Either way, it doesn't bother me. Except when you have fucking little boys in the house that don't aim Get it all around it, and then don't wipe up the fucking seat. Ew. That. Brr. Ew. Mm-hmm. Another reason I never want kids. Well, the FBI develops a profile at this point. I have to say, too, FBI profiles always make me mad for some reason. Because they fucking come after extra large pizzas, and it pisses me off. <laughs> because they said he's overweight, unattractive, and I'm like, those are not synonymous, you motherfuckers. Right? One thing said he's fleshy. Ew. I mean, okay, Jeffrey Dahmer. A girl, I was about to say it. Jeffrey or Ed Gein? True. So the FBI was like, he's probably going to be in his early 30s, white guy, above average intelligence. And they think that he might have a pretty good idea of electrical systems because he had changed his voice on the phone. When people have, like, when they want to be um, anonymous mm-hmm. and they have those deep voices. Yes. That is scary. It really is. Yes. And then they're like a shadow person. Yes. I'm like, uh-uh. So the kidnapper kept calling. He called over and over and over again at, like, weird times of the night. And Sherry's mom How she did this, I don't know. But she was able to talk to him every time. And he was very contradictory on the phone. Like, he would say something made him do it, but then he would also be like, I didn't do it. You know, like, he, it was always like a cat and mouse game on the phone with him. And she was very good at guiding him to get more information. But when he would, like, backtrack or tell a blatant lie, you know, she wouldn't lose her shit on him. You know, like, it, she just, I, I, honestly, I don't know how she did it. Because she didn't know where her daughter was. And then he started asking to talk to Dawn, their daughter, their other daughter. No. hmm And so Dawn would get on the phone, and she was just as amazing as her mother, because he was starting to say, like, it was Dawn's turn now, like... It was like his infatuation shifted from Sherry to to Dawn. Oh, my God. And so they were fearful that he was going to hurt Dawn, too. Yeah. Well, one day on June 5th, he called again, and he told them, we're waiting. God chose us and gave them directions to this place like 18 miles out of town. So police go. When they get there, they find Sherry's body. No. And the body was exactly where he had told them it would be on the phone. Well. Had she been dead that whole time? The whole time. Oh, my gosh. They say that, like, she ha- she was so decomposed that they don't even know how she died. Like, they know, I mean, her cause of death was murder because she died while she was kidnapped. But they don't know if it was strangulation. They don't know if it was suffocation. They don't know if her diabetes killed her because she didn't have her medicine. They don't know. Oh, my gosh. And so it's just like that whole time. They said it looked like he may have, she may have been alive for about a day. Because if she, if he had kept her, you know, if he kidnapped her on like the afternoon of the 31st. And then she wrote that letter at 3 o'clock that morning. Because that was that was her handwriting. She did write that letter. You know, we know he kept her at least 12 hours. So, you know, maybe like a day he kept her alive. So now they have her body. They have a funeral. And the calls keep coming. Oh. Mm. 
he talks about how he was at the funeral and that he's so smart and the police were so dumb. He was right under their nose and they didn't have any clue. And again, it's still the same thing. It's like this cat and mouse game where her mom, Hilda, is really trying to like pull information from him and then he minimizes his participation in it, but then he admits to it, but then he backtracks. You know, it's just this, it's this whole game that's just so unfair. It's so, it's his way, it's his power play. Then, nine days after they found Sherry's body, another little girl, her name was Deborah May Helmick. She and her little brother, she was nine, her little brother, I think, was six. They were outside playing in their yard. Their dad was inside watching TV. And a neighbor looks up and sees this man in a car stop, grab Deborah. She's kicking and screaming and fighting. And he puts her in the car and speeds away. Oh, my God. And so the neighbor runs over there to get the dad. And he doesn't hear any of this because the TV's so loud. He never heard her screaming. And so they jump in the car and they try to chase the guy, but they lose him. And this is in broad fucking daylight. Just like with Sherry, broad fucking daylight. And so... The neighbor could remember the first number of the license plate and, you know, what the car was and kind of vague description of the guy, but it all happened so fast. And so they didn't have a lot to go on. And just like with Sherry's murder, they got a phone call that had very specific directions that led them to Deborah's body. Oh my gosh. And just like with Sherry, there was so much decomposition that they couldn't tell a cause of death. So all while this is happening, they know this is the same person and the police are doing everything they can, tracking down every lead, looking at all the evidence, but there is none. There were there, you know, literally the only evidence left at the crime scene was Sherry's barefoot walking away. But they had the letter. And so they used this device. It's called an ESDA, it's electrostatic detection apparatus. And they use this to look at the paper and it picks up indentations. And so, because it was written on like a legal pad. And so they were able to get the indentations of what was written on the page before it. Ooh. And so when they got it, they saw a phone number. But the phone number that they found was an incomplete number. So they were trying to fill in like, okay, is it a one? Is it a three? Is it, you know, try to figure it out. Well, they traced that phone number to this elderly couple that lived in Alabama. And they get there and they're like, well, this couple is not an early 30s, fleshy, unattractive guy. So what the fuck is going on? So they're talking to him. And the time that... Sherry was kidnapped and murdered. They were out of town and had a mid 30s, fleshy, unattractive electrician that was house sitting for him. Oh my God. Uh huh. So, who's the electrician? His name was Larry Jean Bell. Like I said, he was like mid 30s, he was 37. So, older than the profile. But an electrician, and if you remember, they they thought that he dealt with something with electrical work because of how he was able to distort his voice. I mean, now we just use a fucking app, but back then that was a thing. So police start digging into his background. Old Larry Bell had been convicted of attempted kidnapping before. This was in 1975. He pled guilty and he got a five-year sentence that was suspended to five years probation. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh Uh-uh. And then he was supposed to go to counseling. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. This is what pisses me off about our justice system. Oh, girl, just wait. Oh, gosh. In 1976, they revoked his probation because he was convicted and sentenced to five years for attacking another woman. What the fuck? Yeah. Then... They were like, okay, he could get like 30 to 40 years for this, but 
they were like, well, if you seek treatment. So he went to jail and was paroled after 21 months. 21 months. He was paroled after 21 months after already being in jail for breaking parole. Uh Uh-huh. Then in 1979, he was charged with making obscene phone calls. He loves a damn phone. Who loves the phone more, me or him? That's a fucking close one. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even have an answer to that. <laughs> I have a lot to say about a lot of things. The best thing ever is that we can do voice messages now. So Carrie, who doesn't like to talk on the phone, also Tiffany, in our group chat, because I'm too lazy to write all my shit out because I type just like I write. So there's a lot of likes, a lot of like ellipses. But now I can just, you know, send a four minute voice message and they can listen at their leisure and we're all good. Why, yes, she did say four minute (laughs) voice message. (laughs) And she'll go like halfway through. Oh, my God, this is the longest voice message ever. But (laughs) I mean, self-awareness is is the first step. Yeah. All right. Back to him. Okay. so the police find him. Arrest him. And while DNA testing was not a thing back then, they were able to connect Sherry's blood type with some blood that was found in that couple's home. Like, they know that he took her back there. Wow. And so they also found, like, carpet fibers and stuff like that that matched from that home to Sherry. And that was also, some of those same connections were with Deborah too. So the police had him. Hook, line, and sinker had all the evidence, had him, clearly that's his voice, had him giving all these details and confessions on the phone calls to Sherry's mother. But to make a long story short, he tried to basically plead insanity. There were all these doctors that did tests on him to make sure that he was competent to stand trial and all of this, but he did. And he ended up getting convicted and sentenced to death. And right before he was sentenced to death, they just passed the lethal injection Mm. bill. And so he was able to decide, did he want to die in the electric chair or by lethal injection? He chose the electric chair. Of course he did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing is, too, is that when he was in prison, he kind of kept up the whole, like, trying to seem insane and he just he gave the guards and the other prisoners such a hard time like he never shut up he's donna i i feel attacked (laughs) there's one thing he did you wouldn't fucking do though what covered himself in his own feces and drank his own urine you don't know what i do on my spare time yes i do not that (laughs) oh god ew that is r kelly (laughs) (laughs) well allegedly (laughs) don't sue us (laughs) well i was gonna say like uh manson how you said in lockup like he would put stuff on the windows like his feces on the windows never his shit oh (laughs) no never his no oh i thought so he would cover the window never with his shit his blanket not his shit Oh, well, he's a shitty human being anyway. Mm -hmm. So he was actually put to death. All of his appeals were denied and he died from the electric chair. Deborah's family was still very angry and still very like with his death and all like, whereas Sherry's family is all like, we've forgiven him. And, you know, they even went to talk to him, like to try to get him to confess more. And just like the phone calls, he tried playing them and being like, I didn't do it. Oh, I did do it. Oh, it was voices. Oh, God made me do it. Oh, you know, yeah. something was telling me I had to, you know. And so they were just like, fuck this and ended it and left. So her parents were very much like, God wants us to forgive. So they forgave him, they said. Whereas Deborah's family is way more how I'd be. Yeah. Very angry, very good riddance type, you know. Well, I was going to say, I hope they didn't wet the sponge on him. Yeah, I took it to the Green Mile. You took it to the worst fucking part. Well, I was sad on that man, and I know he was a bad person. My mom, we watched that in the theater, because 
I like learned how to read on the Green Mile books. My mom didn't understand that there were boundaries. She was like, a mouse on the mall and it's Stephen King. It's got to be good. Okay. But anyway, so we went and saw it and I was sobbing. Yeah. Like sobbing. Two ladies in front of me turned around and gave me Kleenex. (laughs) I was sobbing. (laughs) <laughs> so you were me when I watched what's that fucking movie with Lady Gaga recently? A Star is Born. Fuck that movie. You want to talk about like yeah. I needed a fucking minute. Yeah. But my mom was like, Donna, he was on death row. He was a bad person. And I'm like, but he did do, you know, like that yes. whole thing. Like, and oh my God, he didn't. But I know, like, if I knew his story, I'd be like, fuck him too. But with this guy, I'm like, no. Ugh. He's, this guy is the Percy in mm-hmm. fucking the Green Mile. Mm-hmm. Well, you kind of were Percy just then, though, saying don't wet the sponge. But I'm just saying. I digress. So he never said how he killed them. He did in one of the phone calls to the family. He said that he put duct tape around her mouth and all of that. So it sounds like maybe strangulation. Or suffocation kind of in that arena. But no, we don't Gosh. really know. Wow. Maybe this isn't the right time to say this. Which means it's not. Okay, so there is this meme and someone posted it in the Facebook group, I'm sure. But it says, when I get put on death row in 2023 for unspeakable crimes and I have to pick my last meal, I will pick Olive Garden and eat the unlimited breadsticks forever. So my last meal never ends and they can't kill me. <laughs> Damn. I'm like, I'm like, genius. You know, your story was a good example of someone who really does have some mental illness or mental health issues that was very misunderstood. And mine is a perfect example of someone faking it. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Hands down. Does he have some sort of, like, mental illness, such as, like, narcissistic personality disorder or something? Probably. Yeah. I mean, I just said something. I don't actually fucking know. But not in the way that would make him criminally insane. Right. Whereas in your story, he was a tortured soul. Yeah. Hopefully he has found peace. And hopefully Deborah and Sherry and their families have too. Yeah. You know, from the outside looking in, it appears that Sherry's family has, just like they've written some books. The dad was the chaplain for the police department and, you know, made some really good connections with families that he was helping because now he's Sherry Smith's dad, not just the... Yeah. Not just like the police department's chaplain yeah her mom does speaking engagements and all of that i don't know about deborah's but from the outside looking in at least it looks like sherry's has let us know what y'all think thank you so much for listening don't forget to subscribe review like follow all that and remember creep it real and and don't don't get scared. scared